Hello, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sarah Severson, and I'm the Digital Initiatives Librarian at the University of Alberta Library. And my co-presenter today is Jessica Lang, a scholarly communications librarian at McGill University Library. Um, and she will be joining us for the question and answer session after. Uh, what we're presenting today really is early stages of our research. Um, we're going to be sharing some links to our sources in the slides. Uh, so please, I encourage you to, to go download them um, from the session description and take a look and maybe even follow along as we're doing this. Uh, and the reason is, is the goal of today's presentation really is about getting feedback um, on our research project. We wanted to bring this to the library publishing forum specifically to be able to have that kind of discussion and back and forth about what we've been doing. And what we're doing is really looking at who is doing the work. Uh, and so the question here that we want to talk about is just the conversations around scholarly publishing often focus on the cost of the publications for authors and readers, but overlook the questions about the labor that goes into creating these publications. Uh, so questions that we want to talk about are things like who is doing all of this work and how many uh, are they being compensated? And if so, how are they being compensated? Um, is this through recognition and tenure? Is it a monthly stipend, an honorarium? And just more generally even, what is the labor structure of these journals? Um, how many hours of volunteer time go into the Canadian scholarly journal landscape? Uh, and does open access journal structures, uh, like do they have different structures than subscription journals? And so these are the types of things that we wanna kind of go in. And the reason being is our argument is that labor is the primary input for the continued existence of many scholarly journals. So the question of how that labor is distributed and compensated is important for supporting these journals going forward. And so the research question that we are came up with is how labor is distributed and compensated in non-monetary and monetary means in independent Canadian scholarly journals. Uh, so why does capturing this information matter? Uh, first of all, there's just really very little data about who undertakes the labor. Uh, in Canadian academic journal publishing, but even just more generally in uh, scholarly publishing. So we have done a preliminary literature review, uh, which is here, uh, just to kind of outline some of that work. And you can see we have a Zotero group. If you'd like to be able to kind of go in there and see what we found. Um, just to summarize it, it really comes down to four major themes. The first is just research that frames the Canadian scholarly landscape. And so it may or may not touch on labor, um, if it does, it's usually as a side note, but it kind of gives us an idea of what's out there. Uh, second of all, there's research that explores aspects of workflow and labor in scholarly publishing uh, outside of Canada. And so these are things like uh, there's a 2009 study of Spanish editorial boards uh, and also the LPC's um, IMLS study that's going on right now about library publishing workflows. Uh, so very kind of complementary work. Uh, there's also lots of how-to literature, and so this is what we call all the kind of guidelines or best practice documents that uh, maybe they're often kind of aspirational, uh, but they talk about how you should run a journal and how you should kind of divide out the work and do the work. Uh, lastly, the other group of uh, journal articles that we found was really about case studies, and this was how individual journals work. They don't typically focus on the people much, um, and often I would say that they actually probably have an underlying story that they're trying to tell, um, but it does give you a really nice kind of like view into how different journals work. Uh, so from the literature review, we pulled this one quote from a Pooley article on um, the library solution, how academic libraries could end the APC scourge. And it, we pulled it just because it was a really good example, uh, we felt, of just what we all know is true from working with the uh, journals. And this is this kind of um, one devoted editor. And so our theory is, is through this research, is we'll be able to kind of find or reveal maybe three or four different labor models um, as they emerge. So ones that range from having really large editorial teams with mostly volunteer labor, um, some larger editorial teams that maybe have significantly compensated or paid positions, uh, small teams that maybe have one or two kind of one-off positions that they pay, and then finally kind of just small teams with no help at all. And the reason we think this is gonna be helpful, uh, first of all, is just the journals themselves, right? So if we know what these models are and we can kind of point to examples, we're hoping this gives them ideas of what other journals are doing, and um, specifically if they want to change how they, they work. 
Uh, second of all, library publishers. Um, hopefully, this, these kind, having these kinds of models will be useful to advise new journals that are starting up on ways that they could run. And then lastly, just to funders and policymakers. So giving them an advocacy tool to give them a sense of the cost of labors in these journals and the relevance and importance of compensating this kind of work. So now I wanna look at the kind of research phases or how we've uh, decided to do this. And so our research phases here are really about, first of all, establishing criteria and getting a list of journals to work with, um, which is what we've just completed. Um, second of all, it's about undertaking a content analysis of a website, of all the websites of the journals. And that was really to get the emails for doing our next part, which is getting the surveys, um, which we're hoping to do in probably either the summer or the fall. And then we'll fin finalize that with follow-up interviews uh, with some of the journals that they accept. So the first phase was really about establishing the study scope criteria and creating that list together. So just talking about the scope um, this is kind of what our definitions were. So first of all, independent, um, so not a commercial publisher, although we did include nonprofits. Uh, scholarly, uh, so here's talking again about peer review. We did exclude uh, student journals and also other things like professional and trade magazines and bulletins, conference proceedings, um, all of that kind of stuff. Thirdly, we did uh, restrict our study criteria down to Canadian journals. And we defined that as being a minimum of one third of the core editorial board was affiliated somehow with the Canadian post-secondary institution. Um, and we used uh, this criteria was based off of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council uh, guidelines for their aid to scholarly journals grant. Um, which uh, is probably one of the major funding sources for most of the journals in the Canadian landscape. Uh, and then lastly, we added in the criteria of active. And so we wanted to make sure that the journal had published um, anything basically in the last three years. So getting the list together, uh, we actually did it with a number of different sources. Uh, so the first one was the Canadian Research Knowledge Network has a list of open access journals. Um, Coalition Publica, uh, also gave us a list of internally that they'd been using, which was really helpful. Uh, this included uh, journals on EDUD's platform, uh, Shirk funded journals, the Couch membership, things like that. And then we uh, went to Ulrich's The Periodic Directory and did a search for kind of active uh, scholarly and Canadian journals to be kind of rounded out. So after removing duplicates based on title and ISN, and just kind of cleaning it up uh, really briefly, we ended up with just over 1,000 journals that we were going to review. And so this is first, I wanna say a really big thank you because the lion's share of work in terms of reviewing all this journal was done by uh, three U of A SLIS students uh, who were employed at the University of Library at the time. So thank you, Katie Maxwell, uh, Max Field, sorry, uh, Emma Ewell and Minnie Bear Chief. Um, it was really a lot of work and a huge help. Uh, second of all, I want to thank Sonia Betts just for sharing some of the data that she had collected for her own research study uh, that included library publishers and that really rounded out um, kind of some more of the discussions that we'll talk about. And then thank you to the University of Alberta Library for helping out in terms of uh, compensating this labor. Um, so when we say reviewing the journal sites, what did this mean was really actually just going through that list. So I mentioned Previously that we had over 1,000. Um, when we first outlined this research, we knew we wanted to do a survey. And so we designed this part as a means of just being able to get the email addresses to be able to send out the survey. Uh, we tried a few web scraping experiments, um, but just the lack of structure to any of the uh, websites meant that that was kind of impossible. Um, we thought that this was actually gonna be fairly quick to do. Um, I think I estimated the time commitment originally as between two to five minutes per website. Um, it would be really simple just to grab that information. And we figured as considering we were gonna be grabbing the email, it would be easy to grab some of the extra information, uh, like the sizes of the editorial teams and boards and things. Uh, the reality of this is it took a lot longer and that was because we ended up having to actually review each individual journal to make sure that it did meet this study criteria, which we had not anticipated. Um, because in the end, out of that list of 1,000, a lot of them actually did not meet. So for examples here, uh, 149 were no longer active, although had been listed active in these lists. Um, 147 were not Canadian. 
And I will say when we were reviewing these, that Canadian was actually a really hard criteria and something that we did kind of pause halfway through and try and think through if it was um, the best one. And the reason being is that it was actually very fluid um, and wasn't really meaningful in certain disciplines. And so what we were realizing is that a lot of the journals that we were taking off of the list that were not Canadian, um, maybe there was no Canadian equivalent. And so there's probably a real bias in terms of kind of disciplines there. Uh, lastly would be student journals. And so we took 97 off in total. And so that was a huge kind of big chunk from that. Uh, the next thing we did was just record the URL and the email. And we also did grab the year the first issue was online. So this was just to be able to give us a sense of how long the journal had been around. Um, finally, we went and found the editorial team page and we recorded the number of people in name positions, the titles, and the number of people on their editorial boards. And so this included kind of advisory or scientific committees. And then we saved those pages in the Wayback Machine. Uh, lastly, we just recorded if the publication was open access. Um, and then about halfway through this data collection was when we started adding in, um, was it hosted uh, or supported by a library publisher? Uh, and then also just recording who the publishers were. And so that was included um, partially thanks to the data that Slimy Bats had given us. So what did we find out? Um, what we ended up with was a list of 568 journals. And so this link goes to a Google Sheet that I would encourage you to go take a look at. Um, please, again, as I said, you should be able to comment on it. And so let us know if there's anything that should be changed or uh, is wrong. And out of these journals, 65 were open access. Uh, about 43 were supported by libraries. Um, and by that, I mean library publishers, which I was actually really, uh, I think, maybe a bit surprised about. We didn't have a sense of what those numbers would look like. And so this was a lot. Um, the next thing we looked at was editorial teams. And here was where we saw huge ranges, so 56 to 0. Uh, but I will point out that the most common value uh, or the mode was 2. And, but over 48 journals listed actually more than 20 people. Um, what did this tell us? Mostly just that journal teams were really small. And I think we knew that. Um, but I will point out that this is in contrast to the literature uh, that we were reading around the guidelines or the how-to um, uh, descriptions, because they often kind of focus on these very large editorial teams. And so if you read through that, you would anticipate that you needed at least 10, 15, or you know, people kind of helping you out, where the reality we see here is actually probably you have two. Um, the other thing that I will just uh, say here is that editorial teams were not consistently listed and they were actually incredibly hard to find. Um, often we would have to spend a good 10 minutes digging around into websites trying to find they might be listed in different websites, uh, they might have different listings on websites. And I think this is just really uh, important to underline because I think this is work that we can do to sensitize uh, journal editors about the importance of listing and valuing this labor. Um, and here I just kind of point to the COPE best practices on transparency as a, as a really good model for that. Um, next, we looked at the position titles. And so this was uh, probably not as illuminative as I wanted it to be. So in the end, what we did was we recorded individual position titles so that there's 1,561. And uh, when we normalized them down, that became only 364 unique job titles. And so by normalization, what I mean is I just did things like translating the French titles to English as best as I could, um, taking uh, positions that were plural into singular, uh, and then just kind of changing the word around so that we could do some comparison. So Anglophone book review editor became book review editor, and then in brackets, Anglophone. Uh, I think the only, uh, there wasn't much to really kind of say about this, but I would encourage you if you want to kind of go into the spreadsheet, you can kind of look around the data a little bit more. Uh, here's a listing of the top 10 positions. And so you can see that they're all in the editorial stage of the work um, in, rather than the kind of production. The next thing we looked at was editorial advisory boards. And this is, again, including things like scientific committees. Uh, so huge range, 107 to 0. Uh, but the most common value was 0. And this was because it was almost 30% of journals in total did this. I'm not really sure what this might tell us other than 
there is a big range. Uh, but this is where I think it would have been really great to have subject or discipline data, uh, which we have thought about trying to add in maybe after the fact to kind of expand the analysis here. And I think that's because we could really see that the range uh, could be plotted by discipline and get some senses of where. So what's next? Um, a survey is gonna be sent to all 575 journals. Um, we're hoping this comes out in summer 2020. We've actually got the survey in RAD right now, so that seems hopeful. Uh, it's only gonna take 10 minutes to complete, so please, uh, our call to you is to encourage uh, your journals to be able to fill it out. It's gonna include about 15 questions, uh, just to kind of get a sense of who, how many people regularly contribute to the journal, what kinds of positions, how many hours do they work, and are they compensated? And um, then what else I wanted to talk about was just some of the other interesting questions that we found from this data that we might dig into or we would encourage other people to dig into. Uh, so the first thing is, is just doing a real deeper dive into how journals work. So maybe employing some uh, anthropological uh, research methods, doing things like time diaries to get a sense and to be able to do a comparison of how much work you think it is versus how much it really is. Uh, another thing would be to look at the inactive journals. So in our journal list that we linked to, we included a tab of all the journals that we took off. So if anybody wanted to take a look at those 147 journals that are now inactive and be able to maybe dig in, why did they go under? Was there any kind of themes or anything like that? Was there specific time periods? Uh, we did anecdotally start to notice that there was definitely kind of chunks of time uh, or years that they kind of stopped publishing. Uh, last, there's also student journals list in that one. So if anyone wants to kind of dig around on that one a little bit more. And then lastly, just this idea of how do we better maintain these lists? Um, so originally we pulled this list from the Ulrich's uh, periodicals directory. And honestly, this should have been really easy to kind of grab. They had all these criteria in their queries and we can export it as a CSV. And so, the data should have been there and we shouldn't have had to go through and actually qualify if it met the study criteria. Uh, but what we found was that Ulrich's records were probably about 50% incorrect. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have time to do the actual kind of number crunching on what these numbers were, but I really do want to go back in there and look at it because it was significant. Um, and that was about it that we wanted to talk about today. And plus I'm running out a little bit of time, so I'm just going to say, please uh, send us your feedback and ask us your questions, either if it's in this uh, document or later, and we would love to hear from you. Okay, thank you very much for listening.